We're talking in discipleship. We're talking about loving people. Now, can we be honest in the room? Wave at me if we're okay with a little bit of honesty. Loving people is quite hard, isn't it? It's, it's quite difficult, really. Like, we could gloss it, but if we're going to be honest in the room, and we like to be honest at that church, loving people can be so difficult because they can be so annoying. They can be judgy. They can chew loudly. They can have different politics. They come from different cultural backgrounds. We're different ages, different genders. We come from all sorts of different concepts and constructs. And we come into the kingdom of God. And loving people can be quite hard. You've got the external processors who like to talk about everything. Amen, Zedelius. That's us in our household. And then you've got the people who don't want to talk about anything. Like, <laughs> like leave me alone, people. You've got the high achievers, the people who do their BA, and then they've got all their, their grids up on the wall of how they're going to revise, and then they do their master's, and then they do their PhD. And then you've got some people who can't even get off the settee. You're like, it's a struggle. We have people that are just so different. And yet Jesus says in John 13, 34, love one another as I have loved you. It's a bit big, that is, Jesus. And then, just in case we think it's just for the people in the church, he gives us the biggest command, the one big command that he gives you and I. In Matthew 28, he says, go into all the world and make disciples. Can I tell you this morning, you can't make a disciple if you don't love them have to love people. Love is a command. It is a requirement. I have been married for 34 years uh, this year. And I've got to tell you, there's been times when it's been easy to love my husband. I went away to Zimbabwe and South Africa and he put a Valentine's card in my case. It's like brownie points. But there have been days. We're being honest in the room, aren't we? There have been seasons when it has been difficult to love my husband. And if he was standing on this platform, I know he would say the same about me. The time that he first got his boat and we went out on a first trip with my daughter and the boat got stranded on the mud and the tide went out and Rowan and I said, how long have we got to wait here? And he said, 12 hours. And we said, is there any food? And he said, no. And is there any water? And he said, no. And are there any blankets? And he said, no. And can we operate the emergency radio? And he said, I don't know how to. <laughs> there have been seasons when it has been difficult to love my husband. When RNLI came out to get us, the man put a tinfoil wrap around me and said, are you getting divorced? <laughs> I said, no but just give me a minute, I need to go and pray. There have been seasons, but love is not the warm fuzzies. Love is not easier for some than it is for others. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. Can I tell you this morning, love is a decision, it's a choice. Love is also a commitment. It says, I choose to love you and I choose to keep on loving you. Good days, bad days, and everything in between that has tin foil and a stranded boat. Everything, I choose to love you. And when we know Jesus, we see people differently. What happens is we come into the kingdom of God and we see people differently than how we did before we were Christians. Genesis 1.27 says that we are all made in the image of God. Not just the people we like. Not just the people from the nation that we're from. Not just those that we get on with, not those that look like us or speak like us. We are all made in the image of God, those in the church and those outside the church. We are all made. And then 1 John 4.19 says, we love because God first loved us. So when we come into the kingdom of God, our perspective changes, our values changes. We love differently than how we did. But the first thing we have to understand is his profound love, God's love for us. See, it's not just head knowledge, but when you really understand in your heart and in your spirit how profoundly God loves you, 
how deeply, how intensely, how powerfully, how passionately that he would send his one and only son to die on the cross for every single thing that you and I ever did wrong. When we grasp the sheer enormity of that love, when we understand it, not just as a head concept, but in our heart and in our spirit and in our soul, when we grasp it, we love people differently because we see people differently. And I want us to look at a passage this morning that demonstrates just how powerfully Jesus feels about us as individuals. I want to read from John chapter 4. I'm not going to get through all of this passage, so I'm going to start at verse 3. John chapter 4, verse 3. It will come up behind me, but do check what I'm saying on your Bible apps or in your Bible. So he left Judea, that's Jesus, and he went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew. And I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father, Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from himself and his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And he told told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. And they go to have some dialogue about worship. And I'm going to skip down to verse 25. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called the Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared... I, the one speaking to you, I am he. The first thing I want you to notice from this passage is that Jesus went out intentionally to reach and connect. He has thousands of people. Think about this. He has multitudes, the Bible says, thousands on thousands and thousands of people who are coming to hear him. He's getting in boats. He's he's standing on shores. He's, He's doing everything. But you will notice time and time again throughout the New Testament that Jesus always makes time for the one. This chapter before, it's a rich Pharisee. It's a religious man with tons of money. And Jesus makes time for his questions. And here in this passage, I think this is so incredible that Jesus deliberately goes to find this woman. It says in verse 3 to 4, On leaving Judea to go to Galilee, he had to go through Samaria. Now, here's the truth. He didn't have to go through Samaria. Samaria is in, like, the middle of the country. It's like our version of Birmingham in England. If you want to go to the north, you really go through Birmingham because it's the quickest route. And if you're coming from the north, you go through Birmingham to get to the south because it's the quickest route. Well, with Jerusalem and Galilee right in the middle was Samaria. And because we don't know the route, we often miss the context of this. The truth is no one went through Samaria. Everybody, 99.9% of Jewish people would take the long route. Why? Because they were enemies. The Samaritans and the Jewish people, there was bad blood between these two groups of people that went back centuries. No one went through Samaria. But Jesus in verse 3 to 4, says he had to go through Samaria. Well, he didn't have to because of the route. 
he chose to go through Samaria because he knew what was on the other side of that decision. He had to go not for the shortness of the map. He had to go because he knew there was a woman waiting that needed to meet with him. He had to go through Samaria. Samaria used to be part of Israel. They were, they were Israelites. And what happened was uh, they were all one family. They came from Ephraim and Manasseh out of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then in 721 BC, Assyria, another country, come in and they took the whole of Israel and all of Samaria into exile. Now, what that meant was they displaced a whole nation of people. They took you from your homes and from your villages and from your houses, and they said, you're going to live now over here in Assyria. And then, if you read the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, you will see that they're all about when the people finally were allowed to come back. When they were finally allowed to come back into their houses and their homes, this was the rule. You've got to prove your birthright. You've got to prove your genealogy. You've got to prove which family you come from to still be classed as an Israelite. Well, the bad news was this. The Samaritans had been really bad at keeping records, and most of them could not prove that they were Israelites. So they said, then you're not part of us. We have to keep ourselves pure. You're no longer part of Israel. And you can imagine, it's like being thrown out of your own family. The rejection, the anger, the pain, the disappointment. There was genuine bad blood between these now two groups of people. To the degree that when the Israelites built their temple in Jerusalem to Yahweh, the Samaritans said, we're not going to your temple. We'll build our own temple. And they built a temple to Yahweh on Mount Gerizim when Moses gave the blessings and the cursings. They're like, we're going to go over here. The trouble was, if you lived in the north, you had to come down through Samaria to go to Jerusalem. And whenever they encountered each other, there was hatred and bad blood between them. There was such hostility. You have to understand how hostile it was between them to understand the incredibleness that Jesus takes the time intentionally to go through Samaria. Oh, he knows. There's nothing that Jesus doesn't know. He knows the bad blood. He knows the hostility. So we don't even know this woman's name. We are only told where she is from. And if we were Israelites, we would instantly understand when they said she's a woman from Samaria. We'd be like, <sighs> dodge, careful, be careful. These are our enemies. I love the fact that Jesus does not care. <laughs> I love the fact that Jesus intentionally goes to someone that has been ostracized and disregarded. And I wonder this morning, who do we avoid? Who would we go round rather than connect with? Who are the people in our lives that we'd be like, don't really want to talk to them. I think I'll just go the long route. But Jesus comes to dismantle stereotypes. He comes to dismantle our prejudices. He comes deliberately and intentionally to find this woman when everybody else, if you said a Samaritan, they would go, forget it. Go the long route. And yet he intentionally dismantles the prejudice to go find this woman. Who would we be avoiding? Who is it on the tube that when they get on or on the train that would be like, don't want to have a conversation with them? Jesus is modeling something to us that we have got to get over the fact of what we think about people or people groups or types and that we should love everybody because we're called to love people. Not just our people, not just the people that we like. Jesus goes into Samaria where he knows he's not even going to be welcome, but he still goes. Sometimes, you know, our blinkers are on, our judgments are so ahead of us that we can't see the wood for the trees. That's a saying my mum used to say when I was growing up. You know, you can't see the wood for the trees. I'm like, what does that mean? You can't see the wood for the trees. But as I've got older, I've realized sometimes we're so focused on the individual tree, we are not aware that we are in a wood. We're blind to what is around us. Andrew and I just came back from Zimbabwe and South Africa. So many amazing things that God did. We went out there to speak at churches. We went out there to speak to leaders, to help with uh, church problems and, and just being solutions and talking about theology. Joe, God always does things you don't expect. 
Like when you are obedient, you just do what God. He always surprises me. And there was one church that Andrew and I were speaking at, and uh, they put us on a top table, like because we were guests. And so I always feel really uncomfortable with this sort of stuff. But the thing was, because obviously Andrew was speak, spoke before me at this particular church, I got to watch everybody's faces while Andrew's speaking. Fascinating. It's like when you're preaching, you can see you all. You realize I can see you all, don't you? I can actually see you all. And I noticed something. I noticed that there was no people in this church under the age of 40. And so when we met with the leaders afterwards, I asked the question, I said, I noticed that you've got no young people, no young adults. And he said, yeah, yeah, that's true. He said, it's something I'm quite grieved about. And I said, tell me why. And he said, oh, well, even my own son won't come. He said, when he got to the age of 16, I went out and I bought him a jacket and a suit because in our church, we're quite formal with our dress. And he said, so you have to wear a jacket and a suit to come to church. And the women have to wear a certain dress and it's a certain color. And he said, but I said to my son, here's, here's your jacket and here's your tie. And he's like, dad, I ain't wearing it. He's like, but you need to wear it to come to church. He said, I just want to come in jeans and a t-shirt. He's like, oh, son, you, you can't come to church in jeans and a t-shirt. So he stopped coming. And another lady, one of the elders said, yeah, it's the same with my daughter. She's 25. She used to love coming to church. But when I showed her the dress that she has to wear to come to church, she was like, Mum, I'd never wear that. And I felt the sorrow in the room. And I said, can I ask a question? Would you rather have them in church with jeans and T-shirts, loving Jesus and, and worshipping God? Or would you rather uphold the dress code and not have them in church? There was a silence, and the pastor turned to me with tears in his eyes, and he said, Keely, honestly, I'd rather have him in church in jeans and a T-shirt, but it's not just my decision. The truth was, though, every single leader in that room felt the same. And I said, it is your decision. As long as it's modest, they can come in as they, however they like. Let them come in the doors. Let them find Jesus. Let them love Jesus. The truth is we get so stuck on the small things. We get so stuck on the traditions and the, and, the, and the things that really matter to us that we can't see the wood for the trees. We keep people out because of things that matter to us when Jesus is actually saying, come in. Come in. Come with your jeans and your T-shirts and your rips and your tattoos. Come in. We get so focused on the details and Jesus cuts through all of that. He goes to this Samaritan woman and her life is a red hot mess. Five husbands, I mean, I've got one. Five, you've had five. Let me tell you right now, there's a lot of damage there. There's a lot of trust issues there. Maybe it was abandonment. Maybe it's grief. Maybe a couple of them died. We've got no idea. But, but the very fact that she's had five husbands tells you this woman, she's been through a lot. She's not going to trust you easily, five husbands. And the one she's got now, Jesus, is it's clear is not your husband. And it's also clear that she's avoiding people. Have you ever avoided people? Have you ever felt like, I just don't want to talk to people? Well, this woman is coming out in the middle of the day, in the hottest part of the day to get water. That is a woman who's avoiding people. Most people would go when it's the morning, when it's shady, or the evening when it's shady. She's coming at noon. She's coming at noon because she doesn't want to see people. She knows they're going to judge her. Sometimes the church has been so good at judging people and we've been so bad at loving people. We've got to learn to love and not judge. We've got to stop trying to do the work of the Holy Spirit for him. He's quite good at it, helping people, convicting people, changing people. She's defensive. When you read this whole passage, this whole dialogue between her and Jesus, you get the real sense that she's like... I feel a little bit like she'd be from Deptford if she was from... I feel like she's like, yeah, don't be messing with me. You, even when he asks her for a drink, she's like, uh, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan. Like, there's a reason why I don't even want to give you a drink of water. Thank you. You get that sort of defensiveness from her. But I love the fact that Jesus 
is intentional. He goes past the cultural barriers. So he, he deliberately goes to find her. And then I want you to notice this. Jesus starts the conversation. It comes from him. Verse 7 says, uh, will you give me a drink? The second thing, first thing we have to be relevant. The second thing is we have to be normal. Can we just be normal, people? Like, he doesn't jump out from behind a bush with a clipboard. Ta-da! Ten questions I would like to ask you about your TV viewing. And somewhere down there he's going to lead her to talk about Jesus. He's not weird. He doesn't set up a rock and get a microphone and go, everyone that walks past, I'm just going to shout at them about the gospel. He doesn't do that. He just starts a really normal conversation and says, will you give me a drink? I brought a friend of mine to church some years ago. And I've been talking to this friend about Jesus in my workplace for weeks. And back then, I didn't really realize that you could lead people to Jesus yourself. I thought you had to bring them to church for them to come to know Jesus. So I bought her on a Sunday, and I said, uh, she said, I'm going to go forward, and I'm going I'm to give my life to follow Jesus this Sunday. I was so excited. So the preacher preached. He made the appeal. She went up. I, she was up there for ages. When she came back, I was like, brilliant. Carol, did you give your life to Jesus? She said, I'm not really sure. I said, what do you mean? You're not really sure. She said, well, I said I wanted to follow Jesus. And then they prayed over me, and they prayed about me being washed in some blood of an animal. They talked about me being setting up something apart. They said something about being saved by fire and water. And she said, and then they talked about a ghost, which actually was the point where I really wanted to run. I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And she came back genuinely confused because they had used Christian jargon and she had never been in church. She'd only ever spoken to me and I didn't know any Christian jargon. So she came back confused. We've got to remove all the obstacles. Can we commit to being normal in our conversations, please? Can we make sure that we explain things? Even the word sin, people don't understand. They don't use that language. I honestly can tell you because I grew up in this country and for 19 years I'd never heard the word sin. If you say wrongdoing, you can still use a word and explain it. We've got to get past the point where our language is a barrier that people don't actually understand what we're even saying. And Jesus models something here. He starts normal. Can I have a drink of water? And I want you to notice that he doesn't focus when she chucks in the first red herring. Ah, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan, and you shouldn't be asking me for a drink. He doesn't get sidetracked. He doesn't go down rabbit holes. He's very intentional. In fact, what he does is so clever. You know, it's what we would expect from God. He goes from the natural to the supernatural. He says in verse 10 and verses 13 to 14, um, Everyone who drinks this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. And suddenly she's interested. Because she doesn't want to come to this place. She doesn't want to see these people. So suddenly he's talking about something and she's like, oh, there's water that means it's eternal, it's everlasting. I won't need to come back to this place. And, he, and suddenly she's listening. Can I say the world that we live in is full of questions? I told you the last time that I was preaching that I've started this new laundrette ministry. This new laundrette ministry that I didn't anticipate starting has just started, and it's going really well. Like, it's, it's, it's really going really well. And the, this week I went in there, and what's happening is I'm just using the dryers to get my clothes dry in the winter. And that 25 minutes that I'm waiting, every single time, it's like the woman, at the sm- God sends me someone. This week a woman rushed in, and she was like, oh, I'm so sorry if I smell of dog. I work with them. I was like, yeah, smell of dog. She's like, oh, and then we we sat there for 25 minutes. We talked about the NHS. We talked about life, death, insurance policies. And then we got got on talking about Jesus because she said, I'm terrified of death. And I said, I used to be terrified of death. And then I became a Christian. She's like, oh, tell me about that. It was as easy as that. Normal. Came normally. And then at the end of 25 minutes, she's folding her towels. And she said, who knew? And I came in here to get my towels dry. I'll be thinking about Jesus and death. (laughs) So I'm praying for her. I'm praying that all these connections that I'm having every week going in, that maybe we'll even start net church laundrette ministry. 
Net Church Sittingbourne, Net Church Dartford, Net Church Laundrette. Who knows what God is doing because we just need to be open to his leading. People have questions and we've got to take the time to listen. Sometimes we answer things that people aren't even asking. Can I tell you this morning that evangelism is not a rote set of questions. It's not a well-rehearsed set of Bible verses. It's good to know the key Bible verses. But it's not us just going through a system. Jesus never treated anybody with a standard pattern of reply. He treats everybody as an individual. Even this woman, with all of her hang-ups and her queries, she has questions. He takes the time to answer them. Can I say we have to treat people with love and dignity and respect? We have to understand people are individuals. You see, we hold the words of eternal life. We have met the one who changed us, who rescued us, who took us out of mess, who cleaned us up. We have felt his mercy and his grace. We have stood in his forgiveness. We have been overwhelmed with his goodness and his loving kindness. We hold the words of eternal life. This is not just some pamphlet that we know, some well-rehearsed speech that we've gone through. This is us knowing the one who changes us and loves us and rescues us, coming to somebody else and saying, I know the one who holds the words of eternal life. I know the one who can help you with that. I know the one who can give you peace when you've got anxiety. I know the one who can answer that question that you're laying awake in bed at night. Who are you and why are you here? I can tell you, I know the one. And when Jesus encounters this woman, he engages her. He leads her to the supernatural. And you know, the third thing I love that Jesus does is he gets real and he goes deep. It's not surface level with Jesus. He never stays there for long. I will start talking about water, but sooner or later he's going to come to, and you've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. It's like, but I want you to understand that Jesus doesn't do that to shame her. He does that because he wants her to understand he knows her. You're sitting in the room, and you need to understand he knows you. Nothing surprises him. Nothing disqualifies you from him. Oh, he wants you to live your life right. He wants to clean you up and put you right and give you a life of purpose. But you have to understand he would move heaven and earth to connect with you. Even the fact that you're in the room is not a coincidence. He would do everything possible to connect with you because he loves you enough to die for you. It's not just some nice idea. It's not theory. This is gut stuff. This is life stuff. This is cost stuff. Love is more than just a feeling. It is a commitment. And his commitment to you is more than you can even dream, think, or imagine. So much so that he demonstrated it. When he died on the cross, he didn't just say it. It wasn't just words. It wasn't just a card. It wasn't a status on Facebook. He was like, do you know what? Let me show you just how much I love you. And he died an agonizing death. And when he died, I know there would have been a moment when he was thinking about this woman. This woman whose life was such a mess. He says, go call your husband and... She says, I have no husband. And then he reveals himself. He says, yeah, I know. You've had five husbands and even the man now is not your husband. Can I tell you, Jesus will never shame you. But he does want you to get real. He does want us to stop living in the land of delusion and telling ourselves things are all right when they're not all right. He, he wants us to be real in his presence. He's okay with real. Can I tell you that? You don't have to put your game face on with Jesus because he knows everything anyway. I was on the streets of Bristol once inviting young people to an event. And when I was having this conversation, there was a young woman in front of me. She was about 19. We were about the same age at the time. And she was really in my face. We were like, come to this event. It's going to be really great. We want to give you a flyer. And she went, do you honestly believe in God? I mean... <laughs> Don't you just know that believing in God is for weak people? 
I mean, it's just religion. It's just to, it's just patriarchy. It's just to control you. Religion is just about control. Do you not realize that? And as she is speaking to me, I am praying. You know, like Amiga was talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm like, Lord, give me a word of revelation. Give me a word of wisdom for this conversation. And as she is speaking, God dropped a word of knowledge into my heart. It was so clear and so crystal. I literally saw it in my mind. And, and she said to me, how can, you, how can you believe in God? And I said, I think God just spoke to me about you. <laughs> yeah? Really? I said, yeah, I felt like this morning you were looking out your window in your bedroom. I saw a picture so clearly. And as you were looking out the window of your bedroom, there was a swing. And you were crying. You were feeling so alone because your parents have died. And as I am saying this to her, I felt the pain that she had been feeling, like in this word of knowledge, I suddenly could, I felt the overwhelming feeling of grief that she was feeling. And as the words came out of my lips, that only the Holy Spirit could have known, she, her face absolutely fell. Like every defense mechanism, every, every posture, every word that had come out of her lips, it was like it was just her and I and the presence of God, and she just began to cry. Tears, unstoppable, just began to come down her face. And she said, only, only God could know that. And I said, he is real, and he does love you, and I want you to come to this meeting. And you know what? She, that was all that happened. She then came to the meeting, she gave her life to Jesus, and I never saw that girl again. But I know one day I will see that girl again. That one day when we get to heaven, she's going to be there because of that conversation that we had on a street in Bristol where suddenly God revealed himself to her. And I want to tell you, church, we don't have the luxury of waiting and holding and deciding. We've got to be intentional. We've got to be relational. We've got to make these conversations happen normally. And then we've got to love people. We've got to answer the questions they're answering. But we've got to demonstrate we love them. Because he loves them. And I am so glad that someone once was brave enough to come into my workplace and tell me about Jesus, me who had never heard. Suddenly one day came when someone began to take me on the journey and I want to urge you in discipleship. I want you to go out of this place. I want you to be led by the Spirit. Like let's not be weird. Let's not jump out behind bushes. Let's let the Holy Spirit lead you. And you're going to know, you're going to get that feeling, that sense. You're knowing when those conversations coming, seize them. Ask, pray. While they're talking, pray. Say, God, I need you to help me. Give me the right words. It's not always a word of knowledge. Sometimes it's just answering the questions. But I want us to be a church that absolutely loves people. We're not going to judge. We, well, I don't care what politics you have. I honestly don't. Vote however you feel led according to your conscience. But if we are not reaching the lost, if we are not loving people, if we're not demonstrating who Jesus is, we have missed the whole point of what we are here on this earth to do. We don't have the luxury of the opt-out. There's no clause that says you don't have to, but you do. We are all accountable in the presence of God to leading people into the kingdom of God. Why do I feel so passionate about this? Because I once was lost. And I remember, I know what it was like to sit in the darkness and not know there was a God in heaven that loved me. To feel so alone. I remember what it was like thinking there is no one in this world that loves or sees me. And then somebody told me there is a God in heaven who sent his one and only son. Was that person perfect? No. Was that person had all their life together, knew the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? No. But that person knew Jesus. And I want us to stand this morning. I want us to commit afresh that our lips, our hands, our lives a disciple shift this year is going to happen, that we are going to seize 
every opportunity, every moment that we possibly can to show the love of Jesus, to be committed, to refuse to be the judge, not the Pharisee, but to be the voice of Jesus, loving people, reaching people, connecting people to him. Because you know what this Samaritan woman does? She goes back to the whole village, the village that had ostracized her, and she says, come and hear a man who told me everything I ever did. And that whole town, he stays there for two, three days. We have no idea what happened. We only know that so many of them came to know Jesus because of one broken, hot mess of a woman. If he can use her, he can use us. So come on, church. Let's rise up. Let's be everything that God has called us to be. Let's not be afraid or timid. Hey, it doesn't matter how much you know if you know the one who has the words of eternal life. Let's stand to our feet. You know, it's funny when I was in the worship I felt God give me another word of knowledge. That you, there's a woman in this room right now, and you feel so adrift. That was the word I felt God give me. You feel cut adrift. You feel all lost. You feel so far from everybody. You came here today, and you are, you came with your game face. But God wants you to know he sees so behind all of that. He knows exactly where you're at. He knows how broken you feel on the inside. That you've lost all trust in people. And you came here this morning and you nearly never even came. But you are in the room and God says you are not adrift. He can be your anchor. He can be the one that holds you and keeps you and protects you. But you've got to trust him. You've got to let go of trusting just in yourself alone and you've got to put your hands in his and go, do you know what? Jesus, I am. I'm going to start fresh here today. I'm going to give you everything I am and everything I have. I'm going to place you first. And if that's you, we don't have to do this in a crowd. Come find me afterwards. I'm going to be right at the front. I want to pray for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus the way I'm speaking about. Maybe you came today and you're like, I do not know Jesus, Keely, in the way that you're speaking. Well, today is the day. Don't put off what you can do today, tomorrow. He wants to connect with you. It's so simple. You just pray. You can go to the hub. You can come to the front. We'll pray with you. You just say, Jesus, I want to follow you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that you died for me. I'm sorry for leaving you out of my life. I'm sorry for the things that I did wrong. Jesus, I want to live for you. And something happens on the inside. Sometimes it's not the flash and the bang. It's his still, small voice. For me, I just felt the overwhelming love of God. But can we close our eyes this morning? Can we bow our heads? Can we give people respect? If you're in the room today and you're like, Kelly, I I want to come to know Jesus. I want to follow him. I just want you to raise your hand. Just very quickly so I can see who I'm praying for. You need to be brave, but no one's looking. Just raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah, I can see the hands. I want to pray for you. And then I want want you to do something brave. I want you to go to the hub at the back or the hub in the balcony. Go and find someone and say, I prayed that prayer. They've got a little bag for you, a Bible in it, and next steps. We do an alpha course. I really want you to do that. But let me pray for you first. Lord, I thank you for every person in this room that raised their hands to know you. Jesus, I thank you that you are so faithful. You are so loving. You are so good that when we make a step towards you, you run towards us. And I pray that every single person will have a real revelation of who you are. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will do what only you can do, that you will convict and you will take them on the journey of understanding who Jesus is and how deeply he loves them. Lord, I pray for the understanding of the cross. They will know you love them enough to die for them. And all of God's people said. And if you're in the room, maybe you've been too afraid to evangelize, to tell people about Jesus. Maybe you've just felt fearful. Well, I want to pray over everyone today. I don't even want to call you forward. I want to pray over all of us, a boldness, a a sense of being listening to the Holy Spirit when those conversations come. So if you really want 
God, to use you in evangelism, I just want you to raise your hands right where you are and I'm just going to pray over you. Lord, I just pray over the church today. I pray, Lord, that we would know that first and foremost, we belong to you, that we are yours. Our lips are yours. Our voice is yours. Our hands are yours. And every relationship that you place around us, the workplace, the neighbours, every relationship, Lord, we pray you would lead us to have normal conversations that result in talking about you that we would not hold the words of eternal life to ourselves, but we would feel that passion, that love, that desire for those people around us, that you would help each and every one of us make disciples. So Lord, I pray against fear. I pray, Lord, you give a holy boldness to every single person in this room. I pray against anxiety. I pray, Lord, that you would help people to know it is you that does the work. It is your words that hold the life and the power. So, Lord, I pray that nothing would contain us or limit us. But even this week, your army would go out and we would reach so many people for you, Lord Jesus, that we would need two services, three services, four services, that we would pack this place because there are so many people that don't know you. Lord, I pray, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.